Sasha. And I'm Zach. And we're here to review Talisman. I've decided to min-max my min-max, and now I can fight a dragon barehanded. Wait, bare hands? Let's start with character creation. You have your choice of ancestries from Elf, Dwarf, Laywalker, Sprite, Troll, or Ghoul. After you made your choice of ancestry, don't forget to roll for your backgrounds, dictating where you came from in life from your particular ancestry. But as always, there's always the most important choice. What class are you? Assassin, Druid, Prophet, Priest, or the Minstrel himself? Or you could choose from Scout, Sorcerer, Thief, Wizard, or Warrior. Don't worry, there's always two different dedications depending on which class you chose to give you a bit more flavor if you want to be a little different. If there are two assassins in the party, they can be totally different. Alignment! That's an option. You can have neutral, good, or evil. Because everyone knows that you can only be one of those three things. I always enjoy eating my cookies while maniacally planning for my next evil move. Yes, chocolate chip. How shall I devour you while I kill my enemies? Oh, those raisins. <laughs> <laughs> I'm evil. When you're making your character, your stats are separated into two major categories, strength and craft. One being your physical abilities, one being your mental abilities. This is because, as it goes along, they separate these three subcategories dictating themselves into how strong or mentally uh, prepared you are. Depending on which class you want to make and how you want to play, you add one to one of your two major categories, and then duplicate both, separating them into the three subcategories dictating how good you are at several different things. More on that later. Yes. So, as for starting equipment, you're just going to get your starting equipment pack and the remaining gold of what you would have if you went and bought the pack. Uh, they don't really do starting gold because they know you're gonna need this equipment and you have low equipment slots anyway. Remember those stats we just discussed? Well, it's about time to talk about them. Again, talking about the strength stat and the craft stat, called in a relatively interesting way, but it's meant to be, again, your mental faculties. Strength is made up of three different subclasses that you get to put your points into, brawn, Agility and metal. Brawn being your physical might, how much you can lift, how much damage you can deal in close combat. Agility being your adeptness of dodging out of the ways, firing ranged combat, and even dodging them in certain cases. While metal is your physical hardiness, being able to take poisons, eat poison food, because poisons are the only thing you run into in RPGs. Seriously, don't trust food, ever. Literally ever. If someone leaves a piece of a turkey leg on a table, don't eat it. Assume it's poison. Or worse. Or worse. Or it's not turkey. It's usually not turkey. The next part of your stats is craft, or your mental abilities. You have insight, which allows you to read people and investigate, also deceive and bluff. Wits, which is generally your knowledge of the world and or your street smarts, smarts and survivability. Then resolve. This is your mental fortitude. Uh, how strong can you resist spells and pr uh, focus on a task? And both resolve and metal lead to your HP, so you can't have a high resolve character have, have, have a lot of hit points. You want your wizard to tank? Technically you can do that. I wouldn't suggest it, but you can. <laughs> Speaking of HP, it's based off your class, metal, and or resolve, and then gain slowly through levels. Uh, HP comes to characters very slowly, so there's always a risk of death, even at high levels. Talisman is a very uh, simple system. It's a 3d6 dice game that occasionally needs four. Um, though the one thing that you do need to know is you need to have at least one d6 with a separate color, as that is the Kismet dice, which we'll go over later. Speaking of level up, HP is not the only thing you get. You get one additional max light fate, which is something that we'll go over in just a little bit. You get to increase one of your aspects by one. You get to choose a new skill or go into a focus, something deeper into that skill that you practiced at. And you also get your choice of a new ability, whether generic or specific for your class. All right, let's head into conflicts. So first we have to establish initiative. This is really simple. The players will decide amongst themselves who wishes to go first. They will act. Then, they popcorn off to the DM. The DM then picks one of the monsters to act and then hands it back to one of the players and it proceeds until everyone has gone. If there are more monsters and there are players, then the DM keeps going until all of them have had a turn. And it's not always the players who start off. If a sneaky sneak attack happens, they, the monsters get to go first as long as the players were unaware. Well, it's now time to punch the little buggers. 
I assume they'll roll. For every attack, you roll 3d6, one of them being your Kismet dice, which is a dice of a different color, and whether you get a 1 or a 6 is really, really important, but we'll go over that again in a minute. You add up all of your numbers and add up an aspect that's dictated by what uh, aspect you're fighting with. Melee combat's mostly brawn, ranged combat's agility, you're casting spells, well, then you should have something from your craft. Success and failures in uh, Talisman works a little bit differently, though. There's always varying different degrees. If uh, there's always a value that you need to succeed, and if not, you reach a true failure. Now, they, there are crit failures, but it's more of an optional rule. A true failure in combat means that you don't strike the monster, but the monster does get hit you for full damage. An average success, uh, just enough to get over the uh, difficulty number, allows you to hit the monster, dealing damage, and then they will deal half damage to you. Which does provide a bit of an interesting dynamic in combat, because it means that the monsters also hit on your turn. So monsters get a strike twice? Yes. How awful! Yep. Wear armor. Please wear armor. Then there are great successes, where you double the number you were supposed to beat, where you deal your damage and the monster doesn't even get a try to hit you back. That's what you're shooting for. And there's even extraordinary successes, where you triple the number and you do something super amazing, the monster doesn't even get a chance to hit you, you deal your damage, maybe even more so. You get your choice of a benefit of a small list, but one of them involves knocking over the monster, dealing more damage, inflicting some other odd condition to it, or making the scene more work for you than for the monsters, usually. Alright, time to talk about that Kismet dice. This is going to be one of the dice that is the different color than your three dice. So you'll have two of the same color and one that's different. Uh, and these are all d6s. So, when you roll that dice for any reason, uh, if you roll a one on that different color Kismet dice, you're going to generate a dark fate, which is dark and uh, used nefariously against you. But, if you roll a 6, you generate one light fate, which is something for you personally to hold on to that you can use as a boon or a benefit later. There is a cap on these, so use them wisely. But don't be afraid to use them, because you hit max and they just go to waste. Alright, let's go into that light fate a little bit more. Light fate is something good, something your character has dictated and saved up, something that makes them a hero, something that they will use wisely in the face of danger all the time. It lets you add an additional d6 to any roll that you want, but you have to do it before you roll. Otherwise, if you want to spend it afterwards, it lets you re-roll one of your d6s to hopefully pass the success. You can also just use a light fate to generate one extra degree of success, uh, assuming it was a success in the first place. You can't use it on a failure. That'd be, that'd be a little too crazy. But it also allows you to use special abilities from your class, from your weapons, from spells. Everything that a light fate lets you do makes your character stronger in every aspect. And that's something to be shown and used a lot, but also smart. So I could use one of those light fates on my kismet dice to generate more light fate? No. <laughs> so when you say you can reroll, you can only reroll on the two normal dice. Yeah. Let's move on to dark fate. So that dark fate is used by the DM to uh, activate maybe special abilities the monster have, or increase their inflexibility and allow them to dodge out of the way. Or it can be used on your players to activate some maybe a cursed item. Or you can use it to say, have a volcano explode and changing the scene and terrain for your players. Woe be to the players with a GM who has much dark fate. How much dark fate can the DM hold? Only as many as there are players, plus a few extra. Good to know, so you're not totally doomed. Yep. If you're rolling badly, the GM can't use all of it at once. Hopefully. Inside the book, there is a slew of monsters to use, generating by Dark Fate, um, even effects of the Kismet dice when it is rolled. Don't be afraid to use them against your players, that is what truly makes these monsters dangerous. And all of them are laid out in a relatively simple fashion, giving them a threat value, which is what you need to hit them, um, their damage each turn, and so on with some special abilities. It's very plain and simple, making it easy to make your own. There's also optional rules for crit failure and how fate inter interacts with the world rather than just the dice rolls, which is something that you may want to look into depending on which kind of world you're trying to play in. And this book has plenty of world building from both the old board game and to allow you to expand upon it, including... A little map to show to your players, as well as one inside the book for yourself. 
There's also a token set in there for the fates and everything that you might need for later down the line. Like poker chips. Like poker chips. Final, Final review! review! It's a wonderfully pre-established setting that a lot of people are familiar and comfortable with. Uh, maybe not everyone's played D&D, but a lot of people have played Talisman, especially board gamers. The mechanics of the game lead well into RP. They're built for it, in fact. They're so built for it, I'd also recommend this game not only for high fantasy settings, but also for low fantasy settings. Because the deadliness and the intrinsic RP within the mechanics can allow for this interaction with the world that you don't need to rely on magic or magical artifacts to achieve, leaving with a very few modifications a nice low fantasy setting. Cons! If there was something to pull out of Talisman that might be a little bit of a problem is it sometimes overstuffs rules. It feels like they're there for the sake of having them, whether it's tracking creatures, uh, trying to survive out in the wilderness, or exploration in any particular way. It feels like they're crammed in there just to have. Not necessarily a bad thing, as the GMs who want to work with them definitely are, but I would have preferred them more as optional rules. People we'd recommend this to. Fans of the board game, you're going to love this RPG, especially if you want to tip your toes into an RPG. We'd also recommend this game for combat-centric players. This game is mostly about combat, and a lot of the RP comes from combat. So you never have to deviate with your primary form of joy. We'd also suggest this to quote-unquote competitive GMs, as it's a good feeling to have that kind of back and forth with your players, wanting them to outsmart you with their tactics when you're trying to make a difficult combat for them. It builds off of having a dire fight in every situation, even if the creatures they're fighting are something incredibly easy to defeat. This is a good way to try and have your GM and your players work together, or technically against one each other, in every single fight, and it feels that way every time. But in a way that makes it feel like it's an ongoing action movie. Couldn't put it better myself, actually. Thank you for joining us for the review of Talisman Adventures. Um, I hope you enjoy your time here, and come visit us at Great Escape Games. Bye! Bye! Hope to see you soon.